From its conception to its development and release, there is a ton to learn about Insomniac Games' magnum opus, Marvel's Spider-Man. How did Insomniac get involved with Spider-Man? Who are the people behind the game's development? How did they design such an iconic Spider-Man suit? What other games did the team draw inspiration from? Find out all these answers and more in Making of Marvel Spider-Man Game Facts Special The Fallen Hero It's no secret that everyone's friendly neighborhood Spider-Man has a history of so-so video game adaptations. We even have a few videos outlining those games, which you should also check out. The slate of Spider-Man video games was, let's say, worse for wear at the tail end of 2014. Activision had been handling the IP since 2000, which resulted in a few good titles. They kicked things off pretty strongly at the beginning with the Spider-Man PlayStation 1 game by Neversoft, a few Game Boy Color games, and then the tie-in games to Sam Raimi's Spider-Man trilogy. The latter of which even gave rise to what many consider to be the game that revolutionized Spider-Man games forever, Spider-Man 2. After that point though, Spider-Man games were hit or miss for several years. Then, the franchise seemed to hit a high once more with Beanox's Spider-Man Shattered Dimensions in September 2010. Activision wanted to immediately capitalize on that game's success, but unfortunately, impossible development timelines led to rushed games that soured the Spider-Man experience. Spider-Man Edge of Time and the two Amazing Spider-Man tie-in games that came between 2011 and 2014 appeared to have put the IP on ice for several years. But behind the scenes, things were brewing. Spider-Man was, and still is, the most popular superhero on the planet. So, why were the video games based on him turning out so poorly? Spider-Man fans wanted to get their hero back on track, to play a game that made them feel like their favorite superhero again. Little did they know at the time that the next great web-slinging adventure was just a few years away. A powerful partnership. In the midst of the less-than-stellar Spider-Man games being released, the winds of change began to blow at Marvel Games. Their output throughout the 2000s and into the 2010s mostly consisted of film tie-ins, which tended to suffer from the same problem that plagued the Amazing Spider-Man games, rushed developments. These didn't always turn out badly, just take a look at X-Men Origins Wolverine. However, most of them were either forgettable or just not very fun. Remember the Thor game for the PS3? What about the Ghost Rider game from 2007? Yeah, I didn't think so. The relatively low quality of Marvel games up to that point led to their output relying on Marvel vs. Capcom and LEGO Marvel games on consoles, and a smattering of throwaway, microtransaction-filled mobile games by the mid-2010s. The era of the Marvel film tie-in game curiously ended in 2014 with the release of The Amazing Spider-Man 2, a game that many regard as even worse than the first game despite the best efforts of developer Beanox. It's probably no coincidence that this is also the same year that Jay Ong joined Marvel Games as Executive Vice President with the goal of creating a strategy that would quote, usher in a brand new era for the Marvel Games business. In order to overhaul how they planned and created superhero games, Marvel turned to Sony. The relationship between the two companies had been kept strictly in the filmmaking business up to that point, having been partners since Sony-owned Columbia Pictures purchased the rights to make Spider-Man films 15 years prior. However, when it comes to making awesome video game experiences, Sony is also one of the best in the business, thanks to their PlayStation division. This is exactly what Marvel was looking for when it began meeting with the company. The exact details of these secretive meetings have been kept locked up somewhere even Rhino couldn't break into, but this much is clear. Marvel was in talks with Sony for some time, and they wanted to leverage the connections that PlayStation had made from nearly 20 years in the video game industry. One of those connections is somehow simultaneously a titan and an underdog in the world of interactive entertainment, Insomniac Games. The Underdog Since 1998, Insomniac has been responsible for creating some of the most iconic PlayStation experiences, having developed Spyro the Dragon, Ratchet and & Clank, and the Resistance series. For 16 years, Insomniac's entire body of work had been developed for PlayStation hardware, save for Fuse, but the less that's said about that, the better. 
Despite creating some of the highest selling PlayStation titles, Insomniac still wasn't locked in as a first party developer by this time. Funny enough, the first project they ever developed exclusively for a competitor's hardware would lead to Sony finally making the commitment and bringing the Superstar Studio in-house. The talks between Marvel and Sony are believed to have picked up steam, or at least gained direction in October 2014. Insomniac had finally flexed its freedom as a second-party developer by releasing the Xbox-exclusive game Sunset Overdrive, which was receiving the excellent reviews typical of a release from Insomniac Games. At some point after that game's release, the Insomniac offices were visited by a friendly, familiar face, Connie Booth. Connie is currently the senior vice president and head of internal production at PlayStation, but she's been with the company for 25 years, serving first as an executive producer and then climbing the ranks of product development. In her time at PlayStation, she's worked with Naughty Dog, Sucker Punch, and Insomniac, among others, to help them get their games to market. So, by that point in 2014, Connie and Insomniac had a very strong relationship. Having been a part of the conversations between Sony and Marvel, Connie was also the person who brought up Insomniac as a potential development partner for Sony and Marvel, which was the reason for her visit on that day in October 2014. The Irresistible Offer When Connie stepped into the Burbank, California headquarters of Insomniac Games, she met with the studio's founder and head honcho, Ted Price. This was the point at which Connie presented Ted with an irresistible offer. What would you think about working on a Marvel game? You'd think that a question like that might cause the leader of any video game studio to do somersaults and maybe even some Spider-Man-like acrobatics, but not Ted Price. His initial reaction to the question was something that basically equated to meh. According to Price himself, his first reaction was fairly neutral due to Insomniac's lack of experience with licensed material. From the very beginning, Insomniac Games has been creating completely original characters and stories born from their own imaginations, and working with someone else's creations wasn't even something that had crossed his mind. Ted doubted if his team would even want to try to tackle something that was as established as a Marvel character. He didn't say no exactly, but he did let Connie know he would consult the team to see what they thought about the proposal. Insomniac culture being such that Ted Price and his managers always gauge the level of team interest before deciding upon projects. When Ted spoke to some members of the team, he realized his assumption of a tepid response was way off the mark. Insomniac's own Brian Intihar caught wind of the news and demanded Insomniac take the deal and he be made creative director of the project, proclaiming he, quote, would give up one of my arms to work on a Marvel game. A company announcement soon followed and was met with gasps of anticipation around the office. There was no indecision or contemplation of working with an established IP, especially a Marvel IP. According to Ted, the response was more like, are you crazy? Of course we're going to work on a Marvel game. In short order, Ted got in contact with Connie to relay Insomniac's enthusiasm for the proposition, and then the studio took a seat at the table to become the third player in the Marvel Sony talks. The Wondrous Webhead At first, there was no solid plan for what Insomniac would be taking on in this new partnership. However, it was clear from the beginning that Marvel really wanted whatever Insomniac's interpretation was of a Marvel character. In fact, that was the core requirement for the entire project. Wanting to avoid the mistakes they made for many years, the only condition Marvel had was that whatever they made had to be completely original and not tied to a movie or comic. They even gave Insomniac free reign in choosing a character from the entire roster of Marvel heroes to make a game and an original story around. As mentioned, Insomniac specializes in creating original stories and worlds. So, this requirement was definitely a non-issue and was probably even instrumental in having them take on the project. According to Ted Price, the Insomniac team talked about quite a few superheroes they wanted to tackle, but Spider-Man rose to the top pretty quickly. Aside from his role as the most popular superhero in the world, the Insomniac team felt like they identified with Spider-Man. He's a regular guy imbued with incredible purpose and power. Spider-Man has to juggle impossible dangers associated with protecting an entire city with leading a normal life and protecting the ones he loves. In many people's eyes, Spider-Man is a character they can identify with. A character forced to overcome impossible odds, and doing so with a sense of humor. An underdog, just like Insomniac. The dynamic between heroism and humanism that Spider-Man embodies as a character was particularly interesting for Insomniac's writers, who were chomping at the bit to create an original story for a character they grew up loving. 
In fact, just about everyone on the team grew up loving Spider-Man, and you can feel that love and passion for his story in every frame of the finished product. With everyone in agreement, and Marvel more than happy to allow them to create something new and special for a character that's been so well known for decades, Marvel's Spider-Man began development, and became Insomniac Games' first licensed video game in its entire 22 years of existence. Great Responsibility it would take all of Insomniac's power to carry the great responsibility of this enormous project. When everything was said and done, hundreds of people worked on Marvel's Spider-Man to get it into gamers' hands. However, the people leading the development charge were the creative directors. Brian Horton, who had been at Insomniac since 2018 and whose previous credits include work on the rebooted Tomb Raider series at Crystal Dynamics and Crash Mind Over Mutant. Marcus Smith, an Insomniac veteran since the PS2 era, working on everything from Ratchet to Resistance. And Brian Intihar, who started at Insomniac more than 15 years ago as a community manager and has worked his way up to creative director. The director of gameplay, Doug Sheehan, was heavily involved in creating Spider-Man's momentum-based swinging for the game. Art director Jacinda Chu more recently served as art director on Ratchet & Clank Rift Apart and is responsible for the new iconic suit in Marvel's Spider-Man. Along with Jacinda, Spider-Man's lead designer Cameron Christian went on to co-direct Spider-Man Miles Morales and previously worked on Lord of the Rings Conquest and the original Star Wars Battlefront II at Pandemic Studios. Lead director Brian Weiser worked with a team of 12 animators crafting early attack animations and cinematics for the game. Game director Ryan Smith has such credits to his name as Sunset Overdrive and Ratchet & Clank PS4. Head writer John Paquette had previously written several games for Insomniac, including Sunset Overdrive. Finally, the soundtrack was put together by John Paisano, who also worked on the soundtrack for Netflix's Daredevil and Defender series. With leadership in place, Insomniac set about deciding what their Spider-Man game could and would be. Rebuilding an Icon once the reality of what they had to do began to set in, some members of the team at Insomniac began to feel the weight of the greatness associated with the hero they chose to bring to life. The game's director, Ryan Smith, said, It's pretty daunting if you think about it, trying to make a great Spider-Man game and really do it justice. Our director, Jacinda Chu, felt a similar fear of wanting to do justice for such a beloved character. Spider-Man had been around for over 50 years at that point, so where do you even begin to tackle something that already has hundreds of different interpretations and variations? But when they got down to it, the team at Insomniac attacked the development of Marvel's Spider-Man with the same fervor and dedication that they had for any of their other projects. Creative director Brian Intihar's challenge in that role was to create something that strikes a balance between a character that stays true to the spirit of Spider-Man and one that occupies in its own continuity as an original version of the character in order to still have the ability to surprise longtime fans. To rebuild Spider-Man from the ground up, Intihar worked with the Insomniac writing team led by head writer John Paquette, while Jacinda Chu worked on the visual representation of their new Spider-Man. Who is Spider-Man? All units, level four mobilization. Location, Fisk Tower. Fisk? The narrative and structure of Marvel's Spider-Man weren't handled by just anybody. Counted among the ranks of the writers involved with the project were Kelsey Beecham, Christos Gage, and Dan Slott. If these names don't seem particularly familiar to you, you've still probably seen something they've been involved with. Kelsey Beecham, for instance, is responsible for the winding, twisting, overlapping sci-fi narrative of Outer Wilds, while Christos Gage has written for TV shows including Netflix's Daredevil, Law & Order SVU, and Hawaii Five-0. Gage was also already intimately familiar with Spider-Man, having written for The Superior Spider-Man, Spider-Geddon, and the X-Men and Spider-Man team-up title, among other Marvel comics. Dan Slott is another comic writer known for his work on The Amazing Spider-Man, She-Hulk, and Silver Surfer. Each of these writers brought their knowledge and love for the character as well as their own skills and methods to contribute to the story of Marvel's Spider-Man. However, it was their combined efforts that gave us this world and the process of creating it was no easy task. 
first, they needed to figure out who their Spider-Man was. Yes, he's Peter Parker, but who is Peter in this new universe? What relationships has he lost or maintained over the years? How old is he? The question of age was something that was settled fairly quickly. When outlining the new character, the creative team decided that their Peter Parker would be older, wiser, and more skilled than the often teenage versions of the character that have been portrayed in various media. Instead of a 16 or 17-year-old high schooler, Insomniac's Peter Parker would be a 23-year-old who has learned a lot about love, life, and work by the time we meet him. He has a failed, strained relationship with Mary Jane, he's left the Daily Bugle to become a researcher working alongside Otto Octavius, and he frequently meets up with Aunt May to help her at feast shelters. As Spider-Man, he has already gone toe-to-toe -to -toe with primary villains like Electro, Vulture, and Kingpin, and his newest nemesis has a powerful connection to his personal life as Peter Parker, as Paquette wanted to include Peter just as much as Spider-Man in order to tell a man-behind-the-mask story. Right away, Insomniac bypassed the Spider-Man origin story that's so well-known, skipped the tragic loss of Uncle Ben that's beginning to lose its meaning through desensitization, and gave us a Peter Parker slash Spider-Man who has seen and dealt with quite a lot already. From their own knowledge of the character, as well as making use of the Marvel Games Office's access to the Marvel Archives, which contain every Marvel comic ever written, the team boiled the character's narrative thread down to a single statement. Whenever Peter wins, Spider-Man loses. Whenever Spider-Man wins, Peter loses. With this emotional core, Intihar and Paquette, along with the rest of the creative team, came up with a story that feels new yet familiar, with the kind of emotional stakes that would be right at home in any Spider-Man comic. Even when faced with impossible decisions, imploding relationships, and soul-crushing loss, both Spider-Man and Peter Parker stand tall as beacons of hope and positivity in Insomniac's original Spider-Man story. Choosing a Rogues Gallery Oops, guess we're stuck in here for a while. Want to play 20 questions? No? How about we thumb less? Okay, face punch it is. Villains for Spidey's new adventure were chosen early. Creative director Brian Intihar had no shortage of villains he wanted to use and ideas on how to incorporate them. The team considered many villains, old and new, and chose what best fit the story and gameplay, focusing on villains that had an impact on both Peter Parker and Spider-Man's life while also using some fan favorites. Tying villains to both Spider-Man and Peter explains the decision to include more modern Spider-Man villains, like Mr. Negative, who runs the homeless shelter where Aunt May works. But it's not the only reason for Mr. Negative's inclusion. The team liked that Mr. Negative and his alter ego, Martin Lee, were unique, letting players know that this was a new Spider-Man. Additionally, the negative energy weapons that the Inner Demons use was appealing from a gameplay standpoint, forcing the player to change up their fighting strategy to avoid their energy. Vulture was included because of his flying ability, since it could present a unique challenge for Spider-Man from the perspective of gameplay. Overall, each of the enemies used in the game presented a unique ability that worked as a challenge for Spider-Man to overcome. To design villains for the game, the team looked over the history of the characters and made choices to bring them into the modern era while respecting their history. In Electro's case, electricity would light up his face in the shape of a star, much like the classic design. Vulture received a new flight mask that mirrored the look of a vulture's beak. Once villains were decided upon, Brian sent all of the choices with his ideas to lead writer John Paquette, who weaved the tale under this direction. New Spider-Man, new Spider-Look. As the art director, Jacinda Chu utilized the paralyzing amount of Spider-Man history to draw inspiration from and find out what exactly makes a Spider-Man suit. That might seem like a pretty simple problem to solve at first, but Jacinda had to comb through decades worth of Spider-Man to analyze their designs, while also developing a look that would make their own version unique and stand out. It's pretty clear now that she nailed her task. Hard. Insomniac Spider-Man accomplishes the same thing visually as it does narratively, new yet familiar. Despite Spider-Man coming in all colors, shapes, and sizes, as can be attested by what we've seen of across the Spider-Verse, Jacinda determined that the best way to go would be to maintain the red and blue color scheme that people are familiar with, with the same web patterning that fans recognize, originating at the center of the face and expanding outward in all directions. But the new part? Now that's where Jacinda's work truly shines. 
For this new, older version of Peter Parker, the thought process behind creating a new suit was, what would a 23-year-old use and be interested in when making a functional suit? What she came up with was an athletics wear inspired suit that is designed to provide plenty of flexibility while also offering some protection and even offensive capabilities. The blue material is intended to be the traditional spandex or lycra that's often associated with superhero suits and also used in real life for things like yoga pants, with specific paneling in areas that would require reinforcement, such as the knees, inner thighs, inner elbows, and shoulders. Accompanying the blue material is the signature Spider-Man red material, which is still flexible, but much thicker than the blue parts. This red material covers important areas that benefit from light armor or impact resistance, including the head, chest, waist, outer thighs, and hands. Jacinda says that these are areas that could potentially scrape on walls and such while web swinging, so Peter would want those to have extra protection. Then, for the stroke of genius that makes Insomniac Spider-Man look iconic and battle-ready, the white accents. These look great for sure, but they are also an intentional part of the design. The white material on the Insomniac suit is actually a flexible carbon fiber, a super tough material used in things like boats, planes, and spaceships for areas that need to be light but also strong. The white carbon fiber spider on the chest and back is there to absorb more damage, while the white material on the hands and feet can be used for both damage absorption and dealing out damage of his own. Speaking of his spider feet, you might have noticed that this Spider-Man doesn't have the signature red boots that have extended up past the calf on many past iterations of the character. Would a 23-year-old really want to integrate a boot into their costume when the rest of it's inspired by athletics and compression wear? Probably not, and that's how the new sneaker look was born. With that, the suit was down. But what would his body look like underneath? The overall build of this Spider-Man went through a few iterations, including a gangly teenager similar to what we've seen in Ultimate Spider-Man, and a big buff linebacker style build. The skinny spider and the buff bug just didn't look right in gameplay testing, so what was settled on in the end was something in between. A svelte, strong character with clearly defined muscles, but not overly big. Kind of like an acrobat or a gymnast, which makes sense considering the character's skill set. To make sure their Spider-Man looked as strong, skilled, and confident in motion as he did standing still, the animation team actually used a mixture of motion capture and handmade animations. Common things like running, walking, or throwing a punch made sense to use a stuntman's motion capture. But for things that are less common and motion capturable, say crawling up a wall or swinging through the air and doing tricks, special animations were made. Additionally, in order to prevent an event known as clipping, when parts or materials on a character in a video game seem to go through each other, the animation team painstakingly created the animation model for Spider-Man or Rig. This ensured that every muscle, fabric, and limb would deform and act as they would in real life instead of clipping through each other. An incredibly important feature considering the range of motion the character has. Becoming the Spider-Man. When it came time to decide who would bring Spider-Man to life, Insomniac was on the hunt for someone who would be able to accurately capture the dimensionality they were trying to accomplish. Someone who could deliver the wisecracks, but also be believable for the dramatic moments. In the end, they brought on somebody that they had just recently collaborated with, someone who has decades of experience in voice acting, Yuri Lowenthal. The legendary voice actor's name will be familiar to anyone who's enjoyed a video game, anime, or cartoon in the past 20 years, as Lowenthal has voiced characters in everything, from Gundam, to Gurren Lagann, to Ben 10, to VeggieTales, to Bayonetta, to Persona 4, and hundreds of other credits. You get it, he's been in a ton of different things. Among those other credits are two Insomniac projects, Resistance 3 and Sunset Overdrive. When Yuri was brought in to do a test recording for Spider-Man, his participation in the just-released Sunset Overdrive almost worked against him. Some people involved with the project thought that since Yuri had just done that game, he could only be associated with that for now, and he wouldn't be able to be Spider-Man as well. Yuri himself didn't even believe that he would be chosen at first, especially since he was almost double their Spider-Man's age. But from that first test, it was clear that Yuri was the right fit, and work began immediately. He was able to create a new Spider-Man persona while capturing the essence of the Spider-Man voices that have come before in the TV shows, movies, and games, thanks to his lifelong love of the character. The voice acting process is another place where Insomniac's dedication and attention to detail shows. 
You've probably played other Spider-Man games, right? Did you ever notice how he always sounds the same, whether he's standing still or exerting energy? No! No! That's not something most people think about. But the maniacs at Insomniac did. That's why, in addition to all of the dramatic, comedic, and heartfelt lines they had Yuri record, they also recorded two different reads for various conversations, based on whether Spider-Man was at rest or doing something strenuous. It might not even be something you notice in-game, thanks to how seamlessly the dynamic line tracks change. While Spider-Man's mask is iconic, Peter Parker's face is a bit more up to interpretation. Actor John Bubniak provided the face of a battle-worn 23-year-old Peter Parker for the PlayStation 4 original and was received well by fans. But when it came time to remaster the game for PS5 and PC, Insomniac decided to go with a new actor to portray Spider-Man's face, Ben Jordan. Jordan's facial model appeared younger than John Bubniak's. When this change was first discovered, it caused some controversy online, as many people preferred the original look from PS4. Many fans accused Insomniac and Sony of trying to make the character look like Tom Holland, the actor from the Spider-Man Home trilogy, while also criticizing them for making the character look younger. Insomniac responded to this criticism by suggesting that Ben's face better matched Yuri Lowenthal's vocal and motion capture, creating more natural-looking face movement. Ultimately, which version is better is up to each person. But both face models offer us a believable Peter Parker that you could imagine running into on Manhattan streets. creating gameplay that swings. From the project onset, Insomniac knew they had to get gameplay right. They knew they wanted gameplay that was easy to pick up and play, had fluid traversal in combat, and made you feel like Spider-Man. According to director of gameplay Doug Sheehan, the team started with a simple vision statement, play like a superhero movie feels. To help realize their vision, they looked at past Spider-Man titles to see what had worked and what did not, but, perhaps more importantly, they studied what is still a shining example of a superhero video game, the Batman Arkham series. In fact, Doug and others involved with gameplay development would go so far as to say that the Arkham games directly inspired their Spider-Man game. The comparisons are hard to miss. Spider-Man swings around the city, much in the same way Batman grapples and glides around the Arkham games. The rhythmic combat with attacks, counters, and blocks is also similar in structure and feel to the Arkham games. But with Marvel's Spider-Man, Insomniac's goal wasn't to reinvent the wheel, but to perfect it. During development, the first thing the team implemented was getting Spider-Man swinging around an open-world city. The size of the world is important for making web-swinging feel amazing, and the team developed many test maps to understand what building and street proportions would work. Speaking about the game pre-release, Ted Price said that Marvel's Spider-Man was the biggest, most complex game they had ever created up to that point. However, that didn't mean the process of creating the perfect web-swinging sandbox was in any way a struggle for the studio. If you recall, I mentioned that Insomniac took on the Spider-Man project in 2014, almost right after they had shipped Sunset Overdrive a game set in a big open world with flashy traversal and dynamic animations. You can probably see where this is going. Given the similarities between their previous project and what they would now be working on, Insomniac was able to save some time and effort by using the work they had already done on Sunset Overdrive as a starting point for what they wanted to accomplish with Spider-Man, which was to make the open world several times larger and give the player the most accurate depiction of how Spider-Man gets around New York. And, in the eyes of most gamers, they succeeded. Spider-Man doesn't just web-swing. He zips, flips, parkours, and even interacts with special parts of the environment in fun ways, such as sliding through concrete tubes at construction sites, slingshotting himself through the wreckage of a falling sign, or dashing through a fire escape as he wall runs. The imagination and the lengths Insomniac went to in order to create specific animations for these interactions are truly staggering. In interviews, Insomniac developers stressed the iteration that went into every aspect of Spider-Man's development. 
They even codified their efforts in every aspect of the game, with the mantra, Be Greater. Control of Spider-Man's swing was no exception, requiring a great deal of iteration to get to the final result. Some of the improvements to the swing made over its multiple iterations include Gravity increases the higher you are in your swing, which helps to give the player's swings more weight without sacrificing control. The game gently steers players clear of buildings as they're swinging, with dampening on analog input near buildings. Spider-Man's momentum remains camera forward when swinging from point to point. This alleviated a complaint testers had about an inability to swing in a straight line. Web lines shorten to avoid buildings below Spider-Man while swinging. Swinging near the top of buildings causes their swing pivot points to invisibly move up to make the swinging feel more consistent. One particular sticking point for the team was how to get Spider-Man's webs to hit buildings considerately and naturally. The first method they tried was using ray casts, which essentially entailed shooting lines out into 3D space to find the nearest building points to attach to. Relying on this method alone led to some clunky web attachment points on buildings. The team iterated on this idea by manually marking areas for web attachment on each building with a simplified mesh to supplement the raycast method. After shooting a web, the raycast would first bring back several buildings which were in range for the player to attach. The web attachment position would then be positioned on the building somewhere between the player and where they're heading. The team scaled this to the entire city by using a mix of Houdini City generation technology and in-engine prefabs to generate and store all this new manual web attachment point geometry. When designing the game, Insomniac wanted the camera to be very cinematic. To accomplish this, each of Spider-Man's traversal techniques has its own camera scripting. When Spider-Man dips and shoots down, the camera pulls back. If Spider-Man zips away, the camera lags behind to convey speed. I guess the thinking at Insomniac was for the game to feel like a superhero movie. The camera needed to look the part. Arkham was an obvious source of inspiration for Spider-Man's combat, but that inspiration was only a starting position, as the team didn't want the game to feel like a brawler. Insomniac's Brian Weiser worked on Spider-Man's combat during the game's early development. He mentioned that he wanted to give Spider-Man many ways to take down enemies, focusing on moves that would amount to more than just punches and kicks. This would help differentiate their combat from other open-world third-person games, and was a good fit for their version of Spider-Man. Part of Spider-Man's character is an amazing inventor. He made his own web shooters, after all, and he has built a number of other awesome gadgets throughout his history. This was something Insomniac took note of and had a great interest in, especially with their own background in making crazy gadgets for the Ratchet & Clank games. To address this side of the character and satisfy their own need to make gadgets, Insomniac implemented the customizable suit powers that offer plenty of new ways to handle combat. The suit power UI even looks similar to how Ratchet & Clank's weapon and gadgetry UI appears in their games. The powers and learned attacks gave players further agency in how they tackle the game's many enemies. The team designed a lot of verticality into Spider-Man's combat too, and incorporated many ways to get enemies and Spidey airborne. Insomniac knew Spider-Man's moveset would require interesting AI to take on to make Spider-Man's moveset feel worthwhile. To that end, 64 AI classes with unique attacks and behaviors were created and used across the game's five enemy factions. A smaller gameplay team was used to accomplish this, compared to their previous game, Sunset Overdrive, which only had 19 AI classes. Creating the Playground The second most important character in any Spider-Man story is… no, not Aunt May. New York City itself, and Insomniac had an eye to make their Manhattan massive. But just making a bigger world wouldn't work, and Insomniac knew that. Their New York City would also need to feel like it was full of life, constantly active, and have references to a larger Marvel Universe in it. Wherever you go in the game, regardless of what time it is in the day-night cycle, there are always cars driving, people walking around, and random encounters to intervene in. This seems like it should be standard for any Spider-Man game after Treyarch's Spider-Man 2, but Marvel's Spider-Man accomplishes it in a way that feels more real and grounded than previous Spider-Man games. The team even went so far as to hire graffiti artists to add extra authenticity to the streets of New York. As far as existing in the Marvel Universe, it's kind of hard to miss some very iconic buildings as you swing through New York. There's Avengers Tower, the Sanctum Sanctorium, and even the law offices of Nelson and Murdoch, though that last one is much harder to find. 
It's not clear if Insomniac was planning very far into the future by including these locations in its massive map, but even if there are no wild crossover event games, their presence, along with voice lines wondering where the Avengers might be, really work to place Marvel's Spider-Man in that very specific universe. To actually create this world, Insomniac made use of a 3D procedural software system called Houdini, supported by a pipeline of other third-party tools and in-house solutions. Insomniac's principal technical artist, David Santiago, has conducted talks at GDC to cover exactly how he and his team were able to use Houdini to create their groundbreaking iterative pipeline containing everything from the ground, buildings, and traffic to the audio and lighting. The team split up the map of Manhattan into 128 by 128 kilometer tiles that could be generated procedurally. Altogether, Spider-Man's Manhattan is approximately 6 kilometers by 3 kilometers and contains 544 roads and 1,202 alleys, most of which are fake, as New York has far fewer alleys in the real world. To avoid repeat work, Insomniac worked in a three-phase pipeline when designing the city. In Phase 1, roads and basic build geometry were generated and tweaked until finalized. Artists and designers came in Phase 2 and tweaked aspects of a tile, adding detail to building geometry and setting NPC, car, prop, and enemy density using the tools provided by the procedurally generated pipeline. At the end of this phase, the game was expected to be fully playable. Finally, in Phase 3, artists and designers would polish and add handcrafted detail to an area of the game. These phases were done for the city district by district, and the team focused on sticking to this pipeline as having to change a street from Phase 1 could force the team to redo work for Phase 2 and 3, since having adjustments to buildings and roads can affect the placement of enemies, props, and even other roads on adjacent tiles. The Phase Pipeline approach was set up to avoid these pitfalls while still making use of procedurally generated tools. Legacy of Greatness Insomniac reached the finish line when Marvel's Spider-Man hit shelves on September 7, 2018. All told, the process of getting Insomniac signed on, building a new Spider-Man, crafting a new story, developing the game itself, and iterating on their work took roughly four years. That's four times the amount of development time the previous three to four Spider-Man games had, and that much time being given to a stellar studio like Insomniac gets results like Marvel's Spider-Man. From the very beginning, Insomniac had one goal in mind, to make something great. In fact, their in-house mantra that became core to everything they did, Be Greater, was even used as the game's official tagline. The words that pushed every person on the team forward and inspired them to make the best game they possibly could are on every copy of Marvel's Spider-Man. Now, it's been almost five years since that game's release. In that time, Insomniac was bought by Sony for $229 million and finally brought in-house as a first-party developer, and Marvel's Spider-Man has sold over 30 million copies in total. This includes the original PS4 release, the remastered version on PS5, and the spin-off game, Marvel's Spider-Man Miles Morales. It's been a whirlwind for sure, and we also know that Insomniac has been hard at work on Marvel's Spider-Man 2 for some of that time. As of now, there isn't much information to go on besides the announcement trailer from 2021, but there's no doubt that Insomniac is doing everything they can to expand on the world they established, create an excellent experience that fans will love, and deliver something people aren't expecting. Thanks to Mike Alexander for writing this episode, with additions by Overbound. Make sure to like the video and subscribe, because there are more Spider-Man episodes to come. Check out our episode on the development of the preceding two amazing Spider-Man games. This is McGen signing off. Thanks for watching. This has been a Game Facts Special.